and I'm here to talk about how I met Rinpoche and how Rinpoche changed my life. When I first met him, he was probably in 1998. So when I first met him, it was through Patsy, one of his uh, senior students. And uh, Patsy said that Rinpoche was looking for a retreat centre that he wanted to have a look at in Penang. So I was the only one who knew how to get there. It was up on a hill. So when I got to Patsy's house, uh, I asked Patsy, so what do I do when Rinpoche comes out? You know, I mean, what do I call him? How do I greet him? So Patsy was laughing at me and said, what do you normally do when you see a, you know, a guest? I said, shake hands. And she'll say, yeah, go ahead, shake, your, shake his hand, it, it's fine. So anyway, um, met Rinpoche. Rinpoche was very nice. He came, he pat me on my shoulder, you know, said hello to me. So, and then we went off. Uh, we went for lunch first, and he gave us a Dharma talk at lunch. And that was when he asked me, so what do you think of, uh, what do you think of, of, of me as a person? So I was like, okay, but uh, to get me, in, you know, I was a little bit into Buddhism, but not a lot. So he said, oh, you, you're very much like a, a flower on a tree ready to be plucked. That's what he said. So I guess from that particular time, I was um, caught because, you know, he, he uh, I was curious to know more. So that's what we did. And then later on, so in any case, we both, uh, on and off, I would see Rinpoche because uh, Rinpoche, had, we didn't have a, a Dharma center to go to. So from there, uh, I got to know Rinpoche better and Buddhism a little bit better and I took refuge with him a couple of months after I first met him. After which, um, we sort of lost contact for a while because Rinpoche was uh, busy elsewhere. And at that time, I had a bad financial downfall. About two years after I met him, two or three years after I met him, I had a very bad financial downfall. And I was bitter, upset, and I actually had Songkapa statues in the house. And at that time, I remembered calling Patsy and telling Patsy, please come and take away all my Songkapa statues, you know, um, and give it away to whoever needs it because I'm not into it anymore. Bitter, very, very bitter. So she did, um, no questions asked actually. And I lost contact with them for about three, four years. Suddenly, and at that time, seriously, it was, I was at the lowest peak. I won't call it peak then, the lowest of the low at that time. And uh, it must have been like four or five years after that, that uh, I received a phone call from Patsy asking me to come down to KL. Actually, it, was, uh, it, it didn't happen that way. She received a message from Rinpoche that morning saying, that, uh, oh, if she is free, she is most welcome to come join us. But if Adeline is not, it's fine. So obviously that message was meant for me. So Patsy called me and said that, oh, so what are you doing now? And I said, nothing, you know, very depressed. So she asked me, she said, oh, if you're doing nothing, would you like to come down for our first, that was the first Kachara dinner, actually. So me, nothing to do. Okay, so I came down. And that was when we received a message from Rinpoche saying that if Adlin still regards me as her guru, tell her to leave Tsunami Land and come down to KL to work. So I was like, okay, but I don't know anybody in KL except, you know, Patsy and, and, and Ruby. So, so I challenged my guru and said, okay, if it's not so easy, but if I get a job here, fine, I'll come down. But, you know, being, how old was I then? 46, 47? So it was like, seriously, I mean, who's going to employ me? I wasn't very sure about that at all, but I did challenge, sorry, uh, Rinpoche, you know, I, I just said, yeah, if I find a job, I'll come down. So, guess what? Two days after I said that, I got an interview. Um, not even, nobody, mm, this is not Kacharian help. It was just some outside friends that said, hey, Adeline, you want a job? You, there's a, a job in a restaurant here. So that's what I did. I said, okay, I'll come for the interview. Went for the interview, got the job. And I was saying, okay, now I have the job. 
my guru has already said come down what do I do I've, or you know so I being me being me I said okay I'm gonna this time really really accept the fact that my guru has plans for me so I took a leap of faith came down to KL and I started working for a restaurant then the thing is I thought that the Buddhas and Rinpoche has all of these things planned out really perfectly. They, you know, the path that they, they open up for, for me was so easy because I don't know anybody else in KL. So coming down here, I needed a place to stay. Also, I needed to go to work not knowing the roads in KL. So I found out that my job was in Wanutama. So if I had to call up a friend of mine, whom I, I have no idea where she stays. Just ask her, can you, you know, rent me a room or can I stay in your house for like three months or so while I get myself used to KL? So she said, sure, sure, come. And I was like, oh my God, what if she lives half an hour, one hour away because KL is so big, I really don't know where she lived. And guess what? She lives in Banda Utama. It takes me three minutes, literally, to get from her house to work. So it was like planning, it was great, you know. So I worked for a couple of years in this restaurant. On and off, Rinpoche would surprise me with visits. And on one of his visits, he said to me, good, you know, you should learn everything you can while you're here. Who knows, maybe you can you open up your own restaurant or maybe we will open up a restaurant. And um, I was seriously still yeah right I have no money you know I'm just earning a basic salary there is no way I can open a restaurant but of course I was proven wrong because a couple of years later I uh, it was also a path that I believe was paved for me that somebody offered me and uh, a friend I just uh, I had met who is a chef uh, her name is Yeni whom now I own a boathouse with. Uh, we were offered boathouse based on the fact that it was a dying business and all we had to do was take over all their debts, you know, which was not a lot, but it still would mean that we have to go into debt just to pick up the restaurant. Again, I, I decided, yeah, why not do it? So I did. And... Um, when we first opened the restaurant, we had no money. We were in a minus sign, you know, in the red in the bank. And uh, I decided to go to, at that time, uh, Zambala Mystical Treasure, at that time. And I bought a little sasa of Zambala. It was only 40 ringgit. And that was the only thing that we could afford at that time because uh, Zambala is known as the Buddha of generosity and wealth. So we decided to buy one and we invited a little Sasa back to the shop for 40 ringgit. But I also said that, you know, uh, like pray and pray to Rinpoche and the Buddha, so Zambala, and said that if I do make something, if I do make something of this business, then I will invite bigger and better statues. It only took me three months, believe it or not. After three months, I was able to invite an 18-inch Zambala back to the shop. Right now, I have I've invited a three feet songkaba at home. A, a, I don't know, a one and a half. I, I don't know how big the Zambala is that I have at home. And um, our business is really running smoothly. The, the fact is that sometimes it's kind of unbelievable when um, there is like, you know, during the low periods, low seasons, you always think, oh dear, you know, uh, you worry that there's no business. But all the while, ever since my, the invitation of that little cha-cha, business has always been smooth. Even at the lowest uh, seasons, I always, we are always able to hit our target. You know, it, it, is, it is that easy, so to speak. I mean, I must say that it's always with the blessings of Rinpoche and the Buddhas that 
our business is where it is today. When we took over the restaurant, Boat House, my business partner, Gany, uh, she's the chef and I'm, I, I run the outside. Uh, we both, the restaurant deals basically in um, continental cuisine. Uh, basically that means Italian, Spanish, French, all into one. Uh, and that has taken off. It has taken off well. From one floor, we only had ground floor. And last year we were able to take up upstairs, which is, so now we are we've sort of expanded. So we have two floors now. We expanded uh, upstairs last year. So when I wanted to to extend upstairs, I decided that I wanted to invite a Buddha, another Buddha besides Zambala, for upstairs. So I called Henry Uy, who is one of uh, Rinpoche's uh, senior students, and asked uh, Henry to. Uh, to ask for, uh, on my behalf, you know, ask Rinpoche which Buddha should I invite in. So Henry spoke to Rinpoche, and uh, Rinpoche came back through Henry and said that uh, get Buddha Shyakyamuni because it is universal. Everybody that comes into the restaurant will be blessed, and everybody, you know, uh, majority of, of uh, the public will recognize Buddha Shyakyamuni. So I said, fine, um, told Henry. We chose our Buddha Shyakyamuni, which is a three feet one. And the one we like, we said, okay, that's the one we want. So I said, how much is it? Bring out my checkbook, ready to sign. And Henry said, wait, 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 wait. There is a, before you, you give me anything, there is a, a letter from Rinpoche for Yeni and myself. So we opened up the letter and for me it was like, oh dear, you know, uh, do I have like instructions as to, do I have to do prayers, do I have to do uh, maybe a ritual to invite uh, Buddha Shakyamuni in? That was my thought. Well, that was me. So when I opened up the letter, all Rinpoche said was, congratulations on your expansion and I'm offering you this Buddha Shakyamuni as a blessing for your, for your restaurant. So I was like, I read it again and then I turned around and asked Henry, does this mean what I th think it means? And Henry said, yes, Rinpoche is offering it to you. Uh, I was gobsmacked, completely gobsmacked, you know. But uh, I must thank Rinpoche because um, it is one of the... I think this is the most wonderful gift I've ever received from anyone. I have had wonderful comments about uh, the uh, Buddha Shakyamuni in the shop. Everybody that goes up the staircase, that's what they see first. And I've had people come and oh, your statue is so beautiful. I want one, you know. So I said, no problem. You can always invite one home. Coming back up to date, in all of this from the beginning of, of when I met Rinpoche until now, the ups and downs that I have gone through, I have learned that after, ever since I came to KL, I have learned to trust my guru completely, you know. Every time he gives a Dharma talk, yeah, it, it's going in, it's going in now. And I realize that whatever has happened negatively in my past, I realize it's because of my negative karma. And I also realize that it, my life is getting better because I listen to my guru, I do Dharma, my guru is right. So I will carry on, whatever my guru asks me to do, I will do. And one of the things that my guru has asked us to do, or it is his wish, was to see an animal sanctuary come up. So I've been hearing that uh, Rinpoche is, you know, uh, looking at all the animals, they also deserve to live better. So all of this was uh, catapulted by the fact that by sheer coincidence, I was at the right place at the right time and I rescued a dog. Um, who, was, who had been run down, hit and run, and um, both legs were broken so he couldn't get up. So when I was there at 2.30 in the morning, all I could think of, I remember Rinpoche saying, animals, we want a sanctuary, we need to do this. So I couldn't leave the, the, the dog, you know. It took me an hour to, to the, the poor dog was uh, screaming and because he was in pain, but finally I took him to the vet and um, 
had to raise funds because both his hind legs were broken, but everything was done. And then I, uh, I actually sent an email to Rinpoche telling him that, you know, I have this, but uh, my problem would be because we don't have a sanctuary, rescuing anything is easy. But after you've rescued them, we need a place, a home, a shelter for them. I do realise that uh, a lot of lay people think that uh, they're just animals, you know. Why should we care for them when we can't even care for ourselves? But I believe, as Rinpoche says, anything that you do, Dharma, saving animals, is a way... Uh, saving animals is also Dharma. You know, you, you, it, Dharma doesn't mean praying all the time. It's actually what you give what you do to give back to people. So I believe that even if those people who don't love animals, just don't be cruel to them, don't abuse them. But if you do, then show, show some compassion. If it's the strays, feed them if you can. You know, I'm not expecting everybody to be like, uh, like being a martyr and, and go out and start feeding and, and rescuing. But those that can do that, those that can't just tolerate them, don't abuse them. That's my you know, advice to any, lay, any other person who doesn't like animals.